Yeah. <laughs> He's had a long day. I'm pressing on the upward way. Do I tell you?
For the sake of those who aren't usually here or may not know where we're at, let me just say this real quickly. <clears throat> For a long period of time, God has ruled Israel in what we call a theocracy. He is the boss, and they do what He tells them to do. You follow His rules, and He is the only king you need. All the other nations have kings, but God said, let tell them, <clears throat> the nations I brought you out of and let you defeat to get here, they had kings, and what good did those kings do to them? You don't need a king, you got me. Well, Israel kept on the king, kept on the king, kept on the king. Then they used Samuel's sons as an excuse. Samuel's sons weren't real great. They were better than Eli's sons, but they weren't real great. They said, Samuel, you're getting old. We don't have anybody else worth following. And they don't seem to understand that we're only supposed to follow God to begin with. One of the problems is when we try to follow men. I tell you all the time, and I mean it, don't follow me. I will let you down. I don't mean to, I don't want to, but I will. Because I'm human and I make mistakes. Follow Jesus, okay? Now, hopefully we're all going the same direction as we do that. At the end of the day, he's the one to follow. So, Samuel did a really good job of leading Israel, but he's getting old and they want a king. And they and Samuel took it personally. And remember a couple chapters ago, God told Samuel, they didn't reject you, they rejected me. This is personal, but it's not personal against you, it's personal against me. He said, give them a king. That's what they want. They ain't going to learn no other way. And then he proceeds to tell them, this is what you'll get. When you get a king, he's going to take the daughters he wants and make them bakers. He's going to take the sons he wants and make them his personal security service. He's going to take the farms he wants. He's going to take the vineyards he wants. He's going to surround himself with whatever you got that he wants as payment for being your king. And then he's going to get the corrupt things. And you're going to wish you hadn't asked for them. But they wouldn't listen a lot like my kids. They're already headed some things that you know people only learn the hard way. So he gives them what they want now. We pointed this out, and we're, I'm going to point it out again. We're going to move forward. Even though they're out of the will of God, God still makes a way. He does the same for you. He did the same for them. Sometimes we are plumb out of His will. I'll give you a quick example of this, and I, I, this is controversial. Some people don't agree with me, and that's okay. I'm right, and they'll get over it. But the Apostle Paul was out of the will of God when he went to Jerusalem. And God told him several times, don't go. If you're studying through the book of Acts, you'll see this. You get toward the end of the book of Acts, God told Paul, don't go. Through the prophet Agabus, he said, if you go, you'll be arrested. Paul, God wanted Paul to go to Rome. But Paul had a heart for his people, Israel. That's the reason Romans 7-9 through 9 was written about Israel. Paul had a heart for Israel. He wanted to go back to Jerusalem. He wanted to be there, so he goes. What happens? He gets arrested. And for two years, you don't read about one convert, not one. You don't see one people get saved in that two years. No one in Scripture do you see anybody. The closest he comes is Agrippa. And Agrippa says, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. If you're not familiar with that story, you can study that sometime. But the point is, <laughs> even though Paul was out of the will of God, God still made a way for him to be successful. God gets him to Rome, albeit through a broken ship. He gets him to Rome, and he is productive after that. We all get out of the will of God. Paul was human. You're human, I'm human. We all get out of the will of God. But even out of the will of God, God loves you. He wants to see you succeed. And the best way I can explain it, and I've said this a hundred thousand times, but I'll keep saying it because it's true. The best way to understand this is being a parent. As a parent, you know. You want what's best for those kids. You teach them right. You lead them right. You try to make the, them be successful and prosperous. You want good things for them. Don't you? Any good parent does. But they don't always listen to you. They don't always follow you. And you can't decide if you want to hug them or ring their neck most of the time. That's how I feel. How do you think he fit? He wants you to be productive and, and, and successful. He wants to see good things happen in your life. And he gives you all the tools for that to happen. What happens? We do what we want to do. We, we, we follow God when it suits us and then we don't when we don't want to. And then we, we, we struggle to understand why things are so hard. Prodigal son is an extreme example. But I think we all have had experiences where we've seen what happens when we're faithful to the Lord, what happens when we get out of the will of God. So anyway, having said that, God says give him a king, and he gives him a king. And he tells him what he does, this is not going to work out, but I'm going to give you every opportunity. He picks a guy that everybody likes. Saul was a lot like David, he was a head taller than everybody else. He was handsome, he was strong, he was somebody you would pick. He's the homecoming queen, king type brother. You, you look at him and say, oh, that's the guy we'd all vote for. We'd all like that guy. God, knowing this, selects a guy that people will accept. Selects a guy that he thinks, at least on the surface, looks like can do the job and do it well. 
So Samuel picks that guy. God tells him to. Saul was in that job a very short period of time and already he's messing up. Now he did good in the last chapter. He's done a few good things here. But alas, he just can't seem to keep it together. We're going to see that now. Now I want you to notice in the last chapter, 1 Samuel 12 and verse 20, we're going to pick up and then we're going to get into chapter 13. Samuel said to the people, Fear not. You have done all this wickedness. And I want you to notice, he doesn't sugarcoat it. He tells them flat out, you have done poorly. You've done badly. You've not followed the Lord. You have done wickedness. Yet, even though you've done that, turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And we talked about that last week, but I want to reiterate that even though God knew, Samuel knew, the people knew, they had messed up. They had not done well. Still, God loves them. Still, God provides a way. Still, God says, follow me and it'll be okay. Follow me and it'll be okay. How many times our kids come to us? As I get older, less and less and less do I want to whip them. Even when they need it. I had a couple of them, and they're not in the room right now. A couple of them the past three days just keep hitting each other. I walked in the other day, as he hit Gideon. She's too big to be hitting Gideon. And then today she hit Paxton, who's bigger than her. And I keep thinking, you just keep hitting everybody. Why? Well, they were mean to me. Okay. Did it accomplish anything? No. Well, why'd you do it? Uh -huh. That's a favorite answer for a kid. I don't know. And while I'm picking on them, think about it. We do the same thing. We are no better than they are. We do these things and then I'm sure God's wondering, why? Why are you doing that? I would help you. I'm here for you. That's what I'm here for. And I can just see us going, oh, my God, good Lord. You know, we do the same thing. I'm hot too, sister. Let's fix it. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I feel the same way. <laughs> it's hot. Anyway, but I'm moving around too. So having said that, he tells him, he says, Turn not aside from following the Lord, serve Lord with all your heart, and turn you not aside. For then should you go after vain things. And you can fill that blank in with just about any vain things or things that are going to lead to nothing. Money's right at the top of that list. There's nothing wrong with earning a living. There's nothing wrong with making money. But when it becomes your God, you need to let it go. God told Rich Young Ruler that, and he said he's sold a whole lot of other people that since then. So it doesn't have to be money. There's a lot of things we go after that are important to us that don't mean anything to the Lord. But you'll know it when you do it. Turn not aside. For then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Let me just tell you now. Here's how you'll know what they are. If you wouldn't feel comfortable praying and asking God if it's okay for you to do that, probably shouldn't do it. Let me say that again. If you wouldn't feel comfortable going to God and asking Him if you can do something, then probably you don't need, there's no reason to even ask Him. You know you shouldn't do those things. And if that doesn't help you, I had grandparents growing up too, very, very godly. There were certain things I didn't want them to know we did. I would never have called my grandma and said, yeah, we're going to go see a Kenny Chesney concert. How do you feel about that, Granny? I would know better than to ask her that because I know what she'd say. There's going to be drinking there. There's going to be cussing there. There's people going to be half-dressed there. Don't go. That's what she'd said very simply. She'd said, you know, music aside, what are you going to encounter when you get there? I've got a friend the other day who went to a concert. I won't tell you who it was. He had no business going. When he got there, he said he was appalled at the way people were coming out of his clothes. I have a sister who went to a NASCAR race. She said she never saw so many topless women in her life. Listen, if it's going to be somewhere where you're going to be surrounded by that kind of foolishness, you know better than do that. That's not something you should have to ask. But having said that, cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. Verse 22, for the Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. I know we're talking about Israel, but it's true of you and me too. It has pleased the Lord to make you his people. Verse 24. Moreover, as for me, this is Samuel talking, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Plain English, of course I'm going to pray for you. A few verses back, they had asked him to pray for them. He says, of course I'm going to pray for you. But just because I'm praying for you doesn't mean you shouldn't pray for yourself and continue to serve God. I can't tell you the number of people who will call me, text me, Facebook message me and say, Brother Chad, pray for me. And I'm happy to pray for anybody. Some of those people won't pray for themselves. Some of those people won't serve God for themselves. 
And the only time they even mention prayer is when they get in the pit. Um, there's a lot going on in my family right now. A lot. Um, my extended family. My uncle and my cousin are going through some serious stuff. And I found out today um, there's some formal charges placed against my oldest son. He's uh, 24 this year. He's got much trouble. Something he had no business doing. He called me today. He said it happened three weeks ago. I said, son, why are you just not telling me this? I can't help you three weeks after the fact. He said, I was ashamed, Dad. I didn't want to tell you what to do. That's hard for a dad to hear. Because what am I going to do about that? He turns himself in in the morning to see what they're going to do. With him. Got that phone call today. Like I said, it's been a crazy day. Listen to him. I'll pray for him. But isn't it funny how people only call you and ask you to pray for them when they haven't even sought God themselves? Samuel told the people, said, I'll pray for you. And in fact, it's a sin for me not to. But look at the last part of verse 3. I will teach you the good and the right way. Listen. We've been taught the good and the right way. The question is, will we follow it? And I think people are in this room because they do. But just understand, you have to continue to. This is something you have to continually do. Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 is known as a faith chapter. It says, He that cometh to God must believe that He is. That means that He exists. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Quote the whole verse. It's a diligent thing. It's a continual thing. It's a commitment thing. It's a fellowship thing. It's something you continue to do. He says, I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with what? What does that say? All your heart. Verse 24. Serve Him in truth with all your heart. If you want to know why we struggle like we do today, it's because some of us are only serving Him with half our heart. We sing a song sometimes. And honestly, they don't sing it anymore. <coughs> Churches don't even sing it anymore. I haven't heard it in a long time. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender all. got to change that. i will sing it the way they mean it. I surrender some. I surrender some. Some to Jesus. I, that's what they're singing, because that's what they mean. If you don't mean it, then why sing it? All your heart, for consider, ooh, look at the end of verse 24, consider how great things He hath done for you. By the way, that's a lot first right there. If you haven't underlined that in your Bible, I don't know what you're waiting on. Consider how great things He hath done for you. We sing another song. Count you many blessings. See what God hath done. If you'd sit and think about all He's done for you, you can adjust that, sister. If it's that hot, please go turn it on. Okay. Okay. It may not be on. I don't know. It may be on. Um, but if you haven't thought about some of the stuff He's done for you in a while, maybe you ought to. It help. It would help your perspective a great deal. Verse 25, he gives this caveat. This is a conditional statement. The word if is conditional. Uh, Brother David and I were talking about wording and insurance policies. Listen to me. Wording in the Bible is important. It makes a point to say in verse 25, if ye shall still do wickedly. You've done wickedly up till now. God loves you. He wants to make you successful. He's willing to overlook all that. He's trying to help you. But if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed. You and your king. Y'all wanted a king? You got him. Follow God. Let me put that in a nutshell. We're going to get into chapter 13 for still time. Listen to me. If you wanted a king, I gave it to you. You don't need one. I wish you never asked for him. I'm all the king you need. But you wanted one, you got one. I'll still help you. I'll still make you successful. I'll still bless you. Follow me. It was that simple. Chapter 13, verse 1. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, if you have a different version of the Bible, that's worded very differently. Uh, the ESV claims that 30, he's 30 years old and then he's 42. And all, none of that's in the original time. I don't know where they get that from. My Bible says Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. Now here's what that means to me. And y'all, y'all, I'm not going to dispute you over it. Look it up if you want to. I think what that's talking about is, remember when he got, um, when he got 
uh, what's the word? Where the whole ones there? Anointed. Anointed, thank you. When he was anointed, I think it had been a year from the time he was anointed until the time he, he, he took over. And so when he had reigned two years, now he's, now he's been the king of Israel for a while. Not a long time, but long enough to have gotten you know, some things together. He chose him out, 3,000 men of Israel. I told you all before, God told them he's going to pick out the men he wants. And he's going to rip up families doing it. It's just something kings do, okay? He chose about 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Mishmash and in the Mount Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan, that's his son, and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent, every man to his tent. So he's got them divided. He's protecting his son. Look, you'd do the same thing. If you were king, you'd have a certain number of people protecting you. It's just like the secret service. You'd have a certain number of people protecting your kids. It's not all that unusual. But anyway, uh, America didn't come up with that, y'all. That was in the Bible long before there was a. United States. Anyway, verse 3. Um, Jonathan, by the way, just a quick note. Jonathan, Joseph, and a few others. I'm not going to try to name them all. I used to have them memorized. There's a few men in Scripture that there's no evil speak up spoken of at all. Jonathan's one of them. And then don't know. It's just trivia. But anyway. Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And saw it with the trumpet through all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. So when his son attacks the Philistines, that would consider a good thing. They had a garrison there. You have to remember, they're in Philistine occupation at this point. So let me try to explain that from a historical perspective. What had been Israel, they're in Canaan. God had given to Israel because of the time of the judges when they were serving him and they turn away from him. And then they serve him and turn away from him. Because of all that, these other Canaanite nations had encroached upon Israel and they owned portions of it they should never own. Let me tell you something else you may not know. Modern day Palestinians came from these people. We're still dealing with the Palestinians because Israel didn't take care of the Philistines when they were supposed to. David got rid of Goliath and then he got rid of his brothers. See, no one ever hears about the brothers. David took out four of his brothers too. Took out all them giants. But they didn't totally drive out the Philistines. We're still dealing with them today. And by the way, that's a life lesson in and of itself. If you don't get rid of sin, you're going to continue battling with it. And before you say, well, I can't get rid of sin, you're right, you can't. The Holy Spirit can in you through you. One at a time. One of the problems we struggle with as, as Christians that are trying to get sin out of our life, we try to take on the whole thing at once or none of it. You've got to take one at a time, and you've just got to give it to God. Pray about it and make a commitment to the Lord. You're going to quit doing that. Whether it be drinking or drugging or gambling, whatever it is you're doing, Allow the Lord to get rid of those things. If you don't, they'll hang around and continue to hamper your life and you walk with Jesus Christ. And so the Philistines are a picture of that. You'll have, you'll have battles where you win and you claim temporary victory over a particular sin. And watch what happens. If you don't drive it completely out, it'll come back on you. And you'll battle with it and battle with it. That's just a sidebar. I wasn't trying to get into that. Anyway. So Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines. It's just one garrison. This is one of their forts. And you're going to find out, the Philistines had a lot of control over Israel at this time. You'll see that in a minute. But he smote that garrison, and then his dad was so proud of him, he blew a trumpet about it. Verse 4, And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul and Gilgal. Let me explain that. When, when they destroyed that garrison, it made the Philistines mad at it. So that, that verse there when it talks about was had in abomination, that means the Philistines were really angry about it. They were mad at it and they hated it. And they were going to plan retribution for losing that one garrison. Instead of saying, well, we lost that one garrison and to be honest with you, we took that land from Israel anyway. Oh, no, no, no. They're mad about it. They're going to come back and try to fight over it. People were all called together to Saul at Gilgal. Now you'll remember Gilgal. If you don't, it's because you weren't with us when we studied it. We went through the book of uh, Judges. I'm sorry, Joshua. Anybody remember what was special about Gilgal? I've told you several times, but let's just see who remembers. What's so special about Gilgal? Why would we remember that place? I'll tell you what, I'll never forget. Everybody remembers the crossing of the Red Sea. I think everybody's seen the Charlton Heston movie. and uh, Everybody remembers that whole crossing and they've made a big deal out of that. You know what was bigger than that to me? More important and no one ever talks about it was the crossing of the Jordan. In the book of Joshua, when they went across the Jordan, God parted the river. And you say, why is that bigger than the Red Sea? 
Well, to me, a seed is just kind of sitting there chopping water or kind of still. Separating that's one thing. I mean, it's all, only God can do it, okay? But it's one thing to separate a seed that's just kind of sitting there. Rivers flow! And they continue to flow. When God separated the Jordan River, the Bible says that water just piled up and up and up. God wouldn't let it continue down the riverbed, but it didn't stop flowing. God just heaped it up in a pile. And who knows how high that pile got for everybody got across. While they're crossing the Jordan, the Bible says they picked up 12 stones out of the river. 12 stones. These are clean stones. Why are they clean? They're in the water. They've been washed. They're clean. They get 12 stones out, and they set them on the bank. They take 12 dirty stones off the bank and they put them back in that river and then they wait until everybody crosses the Jordan. And you remember, the significance of the crossing of the Jordan is salvation. It's not heaven. People misunderstand that. They think, well, crossing the Jordan is a picture of heaven. Well, no, it's not. Because when you get to heaven, you won't be fighting any nations. When you get to Canaan land and it becomes Israel, there's battles to fight. Now, God will help you do it. There's still battles to fight. The same is true with salvation. You get saved, there's still battles to fight. You ain't through. Some people, especially Americans, think, well, I got saved, I'm good. No, hey, there's, there's work to do. There's battles to fight. There's things God intends for you to do as a Christian. He saved your soul. He washed you. That's what the stones were about. There's a picture of being washed. They took 12 clean ones out. They put 12 dirty ones in. They stood there until every last one that wanted the cross crossed. And everybody got a cross. By the way, for them that don't know, Moses is a representation of the law. The law gets up to the river and does not cross. You remember Moses died the other side of the Jordan. He never crossed. It doesn't mean he didn't get saved. It means the law doesn't get you over the river. Who carried him over? Somebody, anybody. Who carried him over the river? I heard it. Somebody said it. Joshua. Yeshua. Who else is called Yeshua? Jesus. It's the same name. People don't know that. Joshua and Jesus are the same name. Exact same name. It's just a different translation of the same name like Pedro and Peter. It's the same name. So the law couldn't save them. didn't cross over. In, in, in symbolism, Moses doesn't cross over. Yeshua carries them over because it's through Yeshua. The name Yeshua means what? Anybody know? Salvation. His name means salvation. That whole crossing of the, of the Jordan River is ten times more important than the crossing of the Red Sea. And the average Christian don't even know that story. When they got out of the river, they set up 12 stones in Gilgal as a remembrance of what happened in the Jordan. And every time they go to Gilgal, it's to worship, to look at those 12 stones, remember what God has done, give Him the honor and the glory. And that's what Gilgal's for. That's why they go there. That's why there's 12 stones set up there to this day to remember the salvation of the Lord and a picture of what Jesus would someday do. Average human being don't even know that. Maybe we all do. So they gather together at Gilgal. Gilgal's important. These things in the Old Testament are important. You need to study them. They, they mean something. Verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots. Look, I'd be scared. I'm not going to lie. You get 30,000 chariots. Look, I got a car. I think I got run them 30,000 chariots. It would still scare me enough to want to go. Six thousand horsemen and people as uh, as the sand which is on the seashore. By the way, somebody told me this week, I never heard this before. Why do they call sand sand? Anybody know? Just trivia. Why do they call sand sand? The second Bible was from Sherry. Because it's between the sea and the land. Sand, sea, land, sand. Makes sense, don't it? Just thought I'd share that with you. Anyway. And they came up and pitched in mission. See, you'll learn all kinds of stuff at church. Anybody know why they say break a leg before they go audition? Anybody want to know? They're hoping they make the cast. <laughs> Seriously. That's, that's where they came from. Bring me I can do that all night. <laughs> they came up and pitched in mishmash eastward from Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, meaning surrounded. They're, they're, in a, they're in a bad spot. Strategically speaking, they're in a bad spot. Listen to me. Listen to me. Sometimes, in the service of the Lord, it's going to look like you're in a bad spot. Sometimes, you're going to look vulnerable. Sometimes, you're going to feel like there's no way out. There's no way forward. What are you going to do? Sometimes, it's just a test. 
Sometimes God just wants to see what you'll do. In fact, more often than not, when you find yourself in a strait, the Lord just wants to see what you'll do about it. And unfortunately, because Americans are so spoiled, when they get in a fix, most of them, the first thing they do is run to their bank account, run to the insurance company, run to the doctor, run to the specialist, run to the insurance company, or whatever, whatever the, the medical insurance. And it's not until they try everything else that they'll turn to God. You know what you're supposed to do? Go to Him first. There's nothing wrong with having money, nothing wrong with having insurance, but go to the Lord first. Put your faith in insurance, because insurance will let you down. They'll wiggle out of it if they can. I've had them do it to me. The individual saw they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. By the way, today, they would call that anxiety attacks. I mean, I'm just saying, reverently. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Let me ask you a question. Who are these people? Are these not God's people? Are these not the same people God led out of Egypt and delivered the ten mighty plagues? Is this not the same God who opened up not only the Red Sea but the Jordan River to get them in there? Is this not the same God that gave them a land flowing with milk and honey? Listen, they didn't have to go in there and build houses. Houses were there. They didn't have to go in and build farms. Farms were there. They didn't have to go in and plant vineyards and olive yards. They were there. God gave it to them. It'd be like somebody giving you the governor's mansion. All you got to do is move in. And this is the people that when stuff hits, they go hide in the cave somewhere. And before I make too much fun of them, there's a whole lot of Americans just like them. Verse 7. And some of the Hebrews went over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. You know what that means? That's that same river they crossed to get into Israel. That means they jumped the river. That would be like a bunch of Texans running over the Rio Grande. Woo, getting out of here. Don't want to be here for that. Listen, friends, I don't know about you. That bothers me. A fight's on the horizon and they're getting plumb out of Dodge, out of the country, run for their lives. That's what that means. They went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, and as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. Now, if he did anything right in this story, he stayed there near those stones in Gilgal. And God bless him for that. And all the people followed him, but, there's a caveat, they followed him trembling. They're there, but just barely. It wouldn't take a whole lot to talk him out of it. Okay, verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. Now, if you remember back in 1 Samuel chapter 10, 8, we're not going to go backwards, but they've done this before. There was one time before where they waited on Samuel and they would not eat or have the feast without him because they knew the man of God needed to be there. So they waited for Samuel. Seven days they waited and you know, he showed up and he did what he's supposed to do. This time, you'll see what happens. He tarried seven days. That I means Saul was willing to wait seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not, came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Saul looked out and said, man, we're losing, folks. And Samuel ain't here. I believe this was a test of God, and I want you to apply it to yourselves wherever you feel like God may be speaking to your heart. If this don't apply to you, then it don't apply to you. But if it does, you need to get this, because this is the point of the message, okay? Verse 9. Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me, peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. Uh -oh. Who's supposed to do that? Priest. A priest. And not just any priest. An Aaronic priest. Somebody not just out of the tribe of Levi, but out of Aaron. Direct descendant of Aaron. If you're not out of Aaron, you're not supposed to be doing this. The high priest all the way up to Caiaphas. At the very least, Caiaphas was in the right bloodline. You were supposed to be of the line of Aaron to be doing this. You know why that bothers God so much? I'm going to tell you why. Who is prophet, priest, and king? Jesus. And only Jesus. Why can he be all three? Because he's completely sinless. And because he is God, and because he created all the rules anyway, they all... He's not, he's not held constrained by them. Only Christ is prophet, priest, and king. This guy's the king. Earlier, if you look back when he first got anointed, he's trying to be a prophet. Now here, he's trying to be a priest. He's overstepping the authority God gave him. Let me tell you something. Preachers are doing that now. They're overstepping God's authority. 
They're telling people things that ain't in here. Making it up as they go. I saw something admitted this week and my jaw dropped. I had not ever heard this before. I'm going to share this with you. Don't look at me crazy. This is on Fox News. I didn't make this up. I'm not that smart. The Pope finally admitted that this whole celibate priest thing started around 1100. And it's not in Scripture. And you know why he said they did it? He said the reason for a celibate priest in the Catholic Church was because of posterity. When they die, a celibate priest is more likely to give whatever his holdings are to the church. A married priest would be likely to give the money to his kids. So they didn't want the priest to marry. That wasn't since Catholic Church started. That's since the 1100s. And the, the Pope, not Chad, the Pope said this week they're fixing to stop forcing priests to be celibate. They're going to change the rules and allow priests to marry in 2023. They should have done that a thousand years ago. Better yet, they should have never started it. Nowhere in Scripture does it say a priest can't be married. Nowhere. They made it up. And now the Pope is admitting it and they're talking about changing it finally. What about the nuns? He didn't say that about the nuns. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> nuns. I don't find a single nun in the Bible. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, it's a good question, but I don't have the answer. I'm just telling you what he said on Fox News. I saw that before. <laughs> Anyhow, sometimes the point wasn't about Catholics. The point is sometimes men, like the Pope, overextend the authority God gave them, do things they're not supposed to do. Saul here decides, well, Samuel's not here. I'm just going to do the priest's job. Listen to me. Don't try to do Jesus' job for him. Just follow him. That's what's wrong with some churches today. They get so high and mighty, they think they are Christ, and they think they can do just as good as Christ. No, you can't. And then, by the way, the Antichrist is going to do the same thing. He's going to step up and say he can do the things he can't do. Don't fall for that. Remember, we're servants to Christ. If he wants to take 800 days to get here, wait on him. You know where the saying, hold your horses, came from? Hold your horses. People say, oh, that means be patient. It just means be stable. <laughs> just saying. That's what it means. Be stable. <laughs> That's where it came from. All right, anyway. He tarried seven days. And then he said, bring hither a burnt offering, verse 9, to me, and peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. The man of God is there. The man of God's a little late, but he's there. He's there on time. As far as I'm concerned, he's on time. This is why I believe it was a test. God worked it out to where Samuel showed up right as he finished. Not in the middle of it. Not before he started. Right after he finished, Samuel's there. And I think God worked it out that way to see what Saul would do. God knew what Saul would do. Now watch what Samuel tells him. Verse 11. Samuel said, what hast thou done? What have you done? What is wrong with you? What have you done? And Saul said, because I saw. He gives excuses. Listen to me. Every time man does something he is not supposed to do and knows he shouldn't have done it, he makes excuses. When Adam ate from the fruit, God said, why did you do that? You remember what Adam said? Is that one? The one you gave me. In a way, he was blaming God. Lord, you gave her to me. It's your fault. The audacity to blame God for the stuff he did. But we do it too. My kids, man. I asked Evelyn, why did you hit him? He's half your size. Well, he was being mean to me. It's always somebody else's fault. Look, we all do it. Make excuses. Saul makes excuses here. This is what he done. Saul said, because I saw the people were scattered from me. I'm losing folks. They're leaving me. That'd be like me saying, well, there's people leaving the church. i got to do something to compromise what God told me to do to try to keep the people here. Let me tell you something, friend. It ain't your job to keep people inside that door. That's God's job. Let God do it. You teach it right. You preach it right. You stick to the old past. You do things the old way, the way God designed them, not the way man designed them. You start following men, and then you'll destroy the church quicker than you'll build it. You do it God's way. If people leave, people leave. But at the end of the day... Who are you going to answer to that you care about? Is it man or is it God? I don't care what people think of me anymore. I used to. I don't care anymore. I have to answer to him. I'm going to do what he said. 
And that's the way we're all supposed to do it. But you got to be careful following me. His first excuse is, well, people were scattered from me. They were leaving. I, I had to do something. His next excuse is, and thou came us not within the days appointed. You're late. It's your fault. First he blames the people. Then he blames the prophet. You were late. Somebody's got to do your job. You weren't here. Listen to me. There's some things God don't want you to do. And you know what they are. Do the things you know you're supposed to be doing. Leave the rest to the Lord. I had to learn a hard lesson. I used to belong to a soul winning church. I'm talking about I grew up in a church that was dead. I mean doornail dead. You could have rolled a grenade down the center aisle. Nobody would even jump. I mean, I wasn't even sure anybody was breathing in that place. Growing up, I grew up in a dead church. But as soon as I was old enough, got out of high school, I found a church that was out door knocking. They were telling people about Jesus. I didn't know Baptists did that. I was so excited, I joined right away. I was just glad to see they were doing something. They weren't just sitting on a pew. They were out doing something with their salvation, sharing the gospel with people. And I got excited. Woo, I got to be a part of that. But I went too far. I went too far. I got out there and I got it in my head. It's my job to convince people to come to Christ. I'd argue with them. They'd tell me what they grew up believing. And I'd start, I'd start trying to straighten them out. Start trying to correct them and, and, and make them see it my way. And I got it in my head that that's my job. And I'm a persuasive guy. And I can argue good. And I thought, man, I, I'll get them all to heaven. Just let me do it. No. No, you won't. There's power in the name of Jesus. You shouldn't have to do anything except witness. Let me put that into perspective for you, and I've got to close. Listen to me. When you get called as a witness in court, and I hope none of you ever do, but if you get called as a witness in court, how much talking do they really let you do? Do they let you argue the case? No. Do they let you tell anything you want to tell about anything you want to talk about? No. When you give your testimony in court, it's strictly defined by the subject matter where your knowledge in that area. Period. And witnessing is the same way. Your job is to talk about Jesus, how He saved you, and how He can save somebody else. The rest of it's up to Jesus. The rest of it's up to the Holy Spirit. Let Him do His job. But make sure you do it. See, some Christians won't get up off their behind and go do something, and that's bad. Some get out there and try to do too much, and that's bad. Just talk about your Savior. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. We all like to talk about things that we're excited about and happy about. If we've got pictures, I'm fixing to whip you. Me? No. <laughs> Do you want one? No. No, I'm talking about the one bouncing around there. We all like to brag on things that are important to us. And that's okay. You want to brag about your grandbabies? Brag about your grandbabies. You want to brag about your brand new porch, your brand new pool, your brand new car? Fine. But brag about Jesus, too. Just tell somebody about him. Let the Holy Spirit do the rest. He made these three excuses. He said, people are leaving. i got to do something. You aren't here on time. You're late. And here's his third excuse. The Philistines are gathering themselves together. The army's coming. You're not here, and the people are leaving. I had to do something. You know what? The devil will make you think you got to do something. Let me tell you what you got to do. Follow the Lord. Follow the Lord. Do what the Lord says to you. No more, no less. What did the Lord say to you? The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go ye therefore into all the world, teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And lo, I am with you always, even on the end of the world. You just do that. No more, no less. You won't fall into this same trap that Saul fell into. Saul's problem was, he didn't have any faith in the Lord. He was man's pick, not God's pick. That was the problem. And close up with these few verses. Therefore said I, the Philistines have come down now upon me to go, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. I think he's lying there. So I didn't really want to do it. I made myself do it. That's not true. He should have waited on the Lord. He should have trusted the Lord. The Lord knew the situation. Let me tell you something else. The Lord knows your situation. If you'll trust Him, He'll never fail you. Never. And He's never late, by the way. He may be late by your standards, but He's never late. He's always right on time. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord. We sing another song sometimes. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. People say, why don't you want to give up the hymns and go with newer songs? Because the new songs don't tell the truth. Trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. But to trust.
trust and obey. Basically, he just said the same thing. Just trust the Lord. Follow the Lord. Keep the commandment of the Lord thy God, which He commanded thee. For now, would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man of his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded. We're going to stop there. But let me just point this out. Maybe this doesn't apply to anybody here. Maybe you guys are following God and following Him well. Keep it up. There's people watching you. There's kids and grandkids watching you. There's neighbors and co-workers watching you. 